Good evening, everybody. Good to see you all. Welcome to the Parks, Arts, Parks and Community Services Commission meeting of Thursday, July 28, 2022. I call the meeting to order at 6.09 p.m. Thank you for your patience, uh, and it's great to see everybody. So next order of business is uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. Would any commissioner, or how about Director Minter, would you like to lead us in the pledge? Thank you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next order of business is uh, roll call, Ms. Fatua. Commissioner Glab. Commissioner Ashendorf. Present. Commissioner Murphy. Co Commissioner Brown. Present. Commissioner Andrade Vallarta. Present. Vice Chair Dorn Parker. Here. Chair Rutherford. Present. We have quorum. Wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Fatua. Uh, next item on the agenda is public comments. Um, so we'll open public comments for items not listed on the agenda. Each member of the public will be given a total of three minutes to speak. And first, we will take comments from those in the council chambers, then those on Zoom. If there's anybody in the council chambers who wishes to make a public comment, you can approach the podium. And uh, seeing none, if there are folks on Zoom that would like to make a public comment, please use the raise hand option or press star nine and star six when prompted to speak. Ms. Fatu, is there anybody on Zoom? There are no hands raised, Chair. Thank you. Uh, we will close public comments. And now we'll move on to commissioner comments. Uh, in no particular order, starting with Commissioner Ashendorf. You have the floor. Thank you, Chair. First of all, it's great to see everyone this evening and uh, like to say thanks to the hardworking staff because July was an extremely busy month. It started with End Independence Day at the fair and I know you worked very hard to make that a successful event. The concerts in the park, we're all exhausted from all of that fun pickleball, ribbon cutting yesterday at Tanager, uh, and a wonderful exhibit at the Senior Center with artist Anna Paula Lima. And uh, I see that she's in the audience today. Uh, and also the exhibit uh, that's uh, currently uh, finishing up uh, and the art on the fifth. I would like to remind the public that National Night Out is August 2nd, and that will occur at uh, Lions Park. And um, on my trips around town uh, last week, I noticed that Davis Field is undergoing some major improvements, and that's very exciting. And I'd like to share that in the most recent edition of the uh, Friends of the Library, they are extremely happy to let everyone know that the instruments, the musical instruments, um, the concrete was completed, and the instruments are now um, installed, and they wanted me to express a big thanks to Jason Minter and um, the staff for having that done. They're looking forward to a ribbon cutting. So that concludes my comments at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, next, we'll go to Commissioner Andrade Vallarta. Uh, thank you so much, Chair. Um, I think it's always, I'll do the shout out to the amazing staff. I mean, these, uh, the concerts at the park, the movies have just been such a joy to really join in with neighbors, friends, colleagues, um, my own little one. Um, so thanks so much for it's such a great turnout at these events. So clearly the community is responding. So thank you so much for your hard work. Thank you, Commissioner. And then Commissioner Brown. 
just to continue the thanks, uh, my daughter and I walked a couple of miles for the co first concert in the park, and we had a good time, and uh, it was a nice long walk. We got our exercise in that day. Um, and I guess the other thing I would share is that there are we're beginning to have conversations about the possibility of the OC Skate Society holding a roller skating event in Costa Mesa at some point in the future, maybe in the early fall. So I will keep you all updated if that takes place. Um, it could be a great opportunity for Costa Mesa to have some roller skating happening uh, in town. Last year, that happened several months in a row in Santa Ana. It was a really well-attended event. So we shall see. That's it. Awesome. And uh, Vice Chair Dorn Parker. I, I won't steal your thunder. I'll let you talk a little bit about some of the views that we've had. First of all, I wanted to let the other uh, commissioners know I continue to meet with the community that is outside of Brentwood Park, Harper Park, and Linwood Park, as well as our city council member um, to understand how they really see the parks imagined to benefit the community. And I'm, I'm uh, so amazed at the participation. It's just going to be wonderful. And now that we have Brentwood is on the improvement docket, they're very engaged and the community is, is so excited. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, also, one of the things everyone knows, I'm a three trick pony, pickleball, dogs off leash and park improvement. So one of the areas we really looked at was dogs off leash to try to find out what, um, how do we encourage um, management of the park space for the dogs and how do we make sure that there's supplies for the dog owners? And it was interesting, one of the um, uh, families that's very involved in Gage and Brentwood has been meeting with some um, playground equipment manufacturers and one of the things that they brought up, which all uh, certainly would love our staff to explore is that the moms and dads really liked is rather than um, enclosing space for the dogs to keep them away from the children that has been an ongoing issue of large dogs not dangerous but they come romping over to the playground and knock children over is to put a fencing around the playground so that the children are safer the families feel that that also handles if they have a couple different age kids some on the smaller equipment the big equipment so this sort of flips the script it's an interesting way to to do a one part solve and then the second part is really how to do an education uh, of dogs are not allowed off leash, or how do we how do we encourage that behavior? Um, and then I'm just so thrilled to see the uh, um, the construction uh, fencing up at Jordan Park, which is my little neighborhood park. And I I'll let you explain a little bit more. We met um, with um, folks uh, from the city at the park, and uh, I'm just thrilled. And so is the community to see that work undergone. Um, yeah. So thank you, and also thanks to all the staff. Amazing month of activities. I'm, I was tired just trying to get around to them. So thank you, that's all I have right now. Thank you for that, Vice Chair. Um, well, yeah, I'm just gonna echo that. It's been a wow of a month for a PAX department. I mean, it's really worth commending the entire PAX staff and the leadership for July's marathon, all the way from Independence Day to your support for concerts in the park and all the programs for our kids up and running that we know you're doing, Ms. Villasenor and the rec team. Um, Director Minter even got introduced to Baby Hudson, AKA Deputy Commissioner. I was a proud attendee also at the council meeting in support of the proclamation for the Department of National Parks and Rec Month, so I'm sure we'll hear more about that. Um, Mayor Stevens recognized Jason and the entire PACS team for your outstanding service, shepherding the department out of the pandemic and not just back to normal, but to new heights. And so let it be said here and again that we love and appreciate the strides made every day by the PAX team, the largest department in the city, and it's an honor for all of us to be here to uplift and support your work. Uh, I also want to thank and recognize State Senator Dave Min and Assemblywoman Cotty Petrie Norris. Um, this month, they delivered the largest single state budget appropriation to Costa Mesa in the city's history for parks and open space. And I know all of us uh, literally leapt out of our seats seeing the 11.2 mil package and we'll be excited to hear uh, more de details on that from Jason. Um, last night, I too was ecstatic to attend the first pickleball court ribbon cutting with the new uh, playground equipment at Tanager Park. That was a lot of fun. Um, it was really exciting to see Director Mentor, Director Satharaman, Mr. Yang, Mr. Ryan, the whole public works team. The final product completed pretty quickly from approval in just February to now. So really want to commend you guys on that work. Um, and, and it's even from first meeting with pickleballers called picklers, as I've learned, on the vacant blacktop 
uh, with Jason last just September to now. So even that is quite a short timeline and I think re reflects a really strong commitment to the process of public input um, and recognizing the ideas that our residents bring forward. And I heard Mary Stevens say that these won't be the last courts. I also wanted to report that the vice chair and I had a great walkthrough of Jordan Park, as uh, Liz mentioned, where the playground is soon to be renovated. Um, I appreciate Jason, Rob, the whole team looking at ways to improve the parks with eye to kids safety. Um, and also want to commend the residents doing that research and figuring out what's being deployed as a best practice at other parks for dog safety. So I really think we can do some learning there. Um, in a similar vein with the issues at Wilson Park, um, I also just wanted to commend Jason on the collaboration between the Parks Department team and the Costa Mesa Police Department to review the park design through what, I, what you educated me on is the term CPTED, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design Criteria. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to report that we had a great time with the Fairview Park Alliance my first time attending their monthly restoration event, and that's every the second Saturday of every month, 9 a.m. at Fairview Park by the Vernal Pools. And that's it from me. So uh, next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes of the June meeting. Would you like me to make, I'll make a motion. Thank you, a motion from Vice Chair Dorn Parker. Seconded by Commissioner Brown, and we'll call the question. Chair Rutherford, if you can vote. Oh. Yeah. We have no one on Zoom, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Motion carries 5 0 to approve the minutes. I'm not sure why system should be showing. Um, so everyone voted yes who is present today. So it's motion carries 5-0 to approve the minutes. Awesome. Thank you, Ms. Fatua. Um, next item on the agenda is new business. July is Parks and Recreation Month. Um, so we'll turn it up the floor over to you, Director Minter. Thank you very much. Uh, has been mentioned uh, by a couple of our commissioners tonight, July is Parks and Recreation Month, or Parks Make Life Better Month, depending on um, how you look at it, but both of them are very true. Uh, at the last council meeting, council did recognize and, and approve a proclamation recognizing July is Parks Make Life Better, Bark, pff, Bark Park, <laughs> Parks Make Life Better Month. Uh, thank you to the commissioners that were in attendance um, and able to get the photo op. Um, tonight, we have a few things for this item that we'd like to, uh, to present to you. The first is we had put forward an art poster project where members of the community were asked to draw a picture and, and tell us about their favorite park. Unfortunately, we didn't quite get the turnout uh, for the program that we did, but we did want to honor all of the people that have participated, including our very own Commissioner Ashendorf. So unfortunately, we don't have a, a printed poster to show you, but thank you so much for uh, sharing your artistic talents and, and proving why you're, you're so heavily invested in the arts in our city. Um, also, uh, as was previously mentioned, uh, we have a guests or uh, three guests with us tonight. And um, Monique's going to read a little a bio on the artist and a little bit about her kids. And then we're going to invite them to come up to the podium and share their art poster with you uh, and maybe tell us a little bit about why that's their favorite park. So, Monique. So, as Mr. Minter mentioned, we have somebody in the audience who did a poster project, um, Anna Paula Lima, who actually currently has an art exhibit on our second floor of the Senior Center, um, as Chair, I mean, sorry, Commissioner Ashendorf had mentioned, um, but she's a big supporter of the arts and she loves nature. She was born in Sao Paulo, Brazil in 1971, and she has been drawing and painting and creating since early childhood. Uh, she has, actually has a fine arts degree, um, and she has a master's in communication, um, all down from in Brazil. Uh, she's worked as a museologist um, down in Brazil, um, and researching, curating, taking care, and registering its art collection uh, since her time in college. And she has uh, participated in, in numerous uh, group art exhib exhibitions over 30 years. Um, so we're really grateful to have her and her kids here presenting their poster project. So who wants to go first? 
Oldest to youngest, youngest to oldest. All right. Yeah, he'll turn on the, the red light for you. You can speak now. It's on. Now? Good evening, everybody. First of all, I would like to, as a community, say our thank you because uh, we really are eager to looking for the new project in Costa Mesa related to the parks. I really agree, parks make life better. And uh, we join a lot to have a chance to be part of this project. This was my poster about the Winkle Park and a, a place that uh, my kids and I with my husband have gone since we are babies. So a lot of great memories from there, and I think it will be beyond. So I know it's July is a short month for everything you like to do, but God provides even a late sunset. So it's so important that you have vacation with the kids, fun, sun, and picnics, and concerts in the park, movies in the park. And in this my um, poster, I decide to put one of the I think very important uh, personality in this park that is called Bubble Man. He made the giant's bubbles there and a lot of fun for the kids and I confess for adults too to pop at them. <laughs> That's so I, I invite my kids to maybe share their own posters. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next oldest is up. Hi, my name is Hadassa, and um, today I would like to share my poster about Lions Park. Um, it has also become um, a great pleasure to come to this park a lot and get to know the people there that work there, and I would like to appreciate the hard work that they have put into this park to create for um, the kids there. Um, it was also, it's also very great to come here and meet all of you. Um, hi. <laughs> Um, this, um, I also really like this park because it's really popular around there because of also the zip line swing and a lot of kids, um, sometimes, um, argue to get in line for it. <laughs> so I would also like to represent, um, the success that this park has made, um, for our community. And I would also like to appreciate all the fun activities that we have for us to do, such as movies in the park, concerts, and a bunch of fun things that we could do this summer. Even on my summer break when I'm busy, I could still enjoy some of the Costa Mesa activities here. Thank you. So the movie in the park for August is Encanto at Lions Park. So are you going to go watch Encanto at Lions Park? All right. All right, who's next? Hello, my name is Rebecca, and I made a picture of Perez Park because it's fun there, and it's close by my house, so I go there a lot with my family. And sometimes there's not a lot of people there, so it's even calmer, and it's fun to play there. Thank you, nice to meet you. Chair, if you'd like, the commissioners can all go down and, and take a picture with uh, the family and their posters. That would be wonderful. Thank you, Director Minter.
If you want them, you can keep them, or if you'd like them, we can keep them either, I, whichever you want. Yeah, it's for, it's for the city. Okay. Yeah, just give them to, to Rob right there. Thank you so much, girls, all of you, for participating. And see you at Encanto. Well, thank you again to uh, Commissioner Ashendorf for participating. I'm sorry I don't have your poster here to, to show off. Do you have it with you by chance? No? Okay. All right, so next up, um, you know, as you're reading the item, we, we deal with a couple of different organizations. CPRS is the California Parks and Recreation Society. The other organization is the National Recreation and Parks Association. Uh, that's the, the national network that uh, both of which we use for training and resources and materials. And they really do help advocate for all parks and recreation causes, training and, and doing you know, everything they can to help us as organizations thrive. Uh, we do have a video, a short video that we're going to show um, that was produced through NRPA. And I believe Laura is, has it ready to go. In every community, there is a place where people of all backgrounds can gather to talk, exercise, learn, or relax. In every community, there are parks. The economic value of park systems are vast. Using just five studies completed in the last five years, municipal park systems located in Ohio, New York, North Carolina, Washington, and Colorado delivered more than $5.4 billion in economic value. Parks have economic power. Parks protect and conserve biodiversity while keeping our air and water clean. Parks have environmental power. Access to parks and recreation facilities aids in the control of obesity, helps diminish the risk of disease, and can increase life expectancy. Parks have health power. Parks increase social capital. Park-like public spaces encourage residents to leave the isolation of their apartments, socialize with one another, and form lasting ties. Parks have community power. In Macon, Georgia, a revitalized park that included new programming and beautification efforts reduced incidents of crime and violence by 50%. Parks have safety power. Parks have the power to strengthen communities, transform lives, and protect the future. Fact is, parks are the most powerful aspect of every community. Share the power of parks with yours. Learn more about the power of parks at nrpa.org. So that is a little piece from NRPA. And not to be outdone, we had our very own Onique Via Senor put together a little slideshow that we presented to City Council. So if you didn't see it, here's your chance now. And on that last picture, just so you know that my staff did not let me be in the photo, I got to take the photo of all of them. But they're the ones that do all the hard work. So thank you for your support. Thank you for our staff and all of their support. And, and we'd be remiss if we don't mention the impact that Public Works, our Public Works Department has. Because without them providing the maintenance on not only the parks, the grass, the ponds, the, the structures, everything, like we would not be able to do the jobs we do. So it's a team effort. And, and thank you to Rob, Sung, Raja and all of the maintenance staff that do what they do. So that concludes our, our presentation on July is, is Parks and Recreation Month or Parks Make Life Better Month. And um, if there's any questions from the commissioners, I'd be happy to answer them.
Are there any commissioner questions or comments? All right, seeing none, thank you again, Jason. Um, to all of you, we appreciate all of your work. We, we did have one more thing, sorry. I, I mentioned it before. Um, on your each of your chairs, you had a, a special gift um, commemorating the ribbon cutting at Tanager Park yesterday. And if you'd like to uh, unsheath your paddles, um, on one side obviously is the, the personalization, on the other side is our, is our motto, Parks Make Life Better. Um, if you'd like, we can do a photo with the commissioners down um, in front of the desk. Um, commemorating um, July is Parks Make Life Better Month. Thank you again, Director Mentor, to the PACS team and the Public Services team. It's a team effort. The next item on the agenda is the review of the proposed improvements to the Tewinkle Lake system with presentation by Robert Ryan, Maintenance Services Manager, and Mr. Yang, City Engineer. Good evening, Chair Rutherford, Commissioners. Uh, we are here to review the proposed improvements for the Tewinkle Lake system. Uh, we're joined this evening by a representative from Pacific Advanced Engineering, uh, which is the firm that is contracted for the design phase of the, con of the project. Um, we're here to present some design concepts and to receive input from commissioners as well as the community on the project. Uh, I'll give you a little brief background before I turn it over to, uh, uh, to Mr. Andy Coburn. Uh, Tewinkle Park is a 49-acre park which was dedicated in 1965 in honor of the first mayor of the city of Costa Mesa, which was Charles T. Winkle. Uh, within the park are, uh, it lies the Tewinkle Lake System, which is a group of artificial water features that consists of uh, two lakes, two ponds, an intermediate pond, five streams, uh, nearly two acres of water surface, and approximately 3,250 linear feet of shoreline. Uh, over the past several years, um, water leakage has developed in uh, the two primary lakes, resulting in a significant water loss, as well as the undermining of the lake bed and surrounding soil. Uh, these leaks have worsened over time. Uh, the pumps, the gravel bed, the biological filter, uh, as well as the aeration systems have been non-functioning. Uh, they're in need of repair. Uh, the pump that operates the circulation system is currently off. Um, that's due to some, uh, I believe that there was some air that was getting into the system. It was causing some cavitations uh, to that pump. And rather than uh, risk uh, severely damaging that pump, we shut the system down. Um, the water quality of the lakes has also been compromised uh, due to extra excess nutrient inputs. Um, and the lack of circulation and along with those nutrient inputs has made it difficult to control algae blooms, especially during summer months. Uh, fortunately, uh, the city has planned a capital improvement project to address these concerns, and we're currently in the design phase of that project. Uh, the city's brought in uh, Pacific Advanced Civil Engineering, 
to evaluate the LIG system, uh, produce a set of working plans, specifications, and estimates that will address the existing deficiencies. Uh, in addition to approving the functionality and operational efficiency of the lake system, the goal is to improve the aesthetic and recreation value as well. Uh, PACE has a great deal of experience in designing and redesigning lake systems for various municipalities nationwide uh, in order to meet goals such as these. Uh, they've prepared an assessment report and recommendation, which you have before you as attachment one in the report. And they've identified a few key opportunities for improvement, uh, replacement of the lake liner, uh, replacement of damaged shorelines, uh, redesigning lake edges, uh, upgrades to the entire system, uh, additional landscape improvements. Um, PACE has also prepared a presentation this evening that will provide an overview of the issues and provide some recommendations for solutions. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Andy Comer, Vice President of Pacific Advanced Civil Engineering. Thank you, Bob. Andy Comer of PACE, and uh, so happy to be here today. 21 years at PACE doing water engineering. Love water, water treatment. Our company, ironically, is big into lakes. We've been into big, uh, big into lakes since the 1970s, and we've done hundreds and hundreds of lakes in Southern California. I've been fortunate to do lakes on world-class projects like the new Ram Stadium where they have the Super Bowl. There's two lakes that receive recycled water and you kind of see it on TV, it gets you excited. I've also been to Calgary, Canada. We've done lakes up there where they use it as a drinking water reservoir. But it's neat for me to do one down the street from my house. I coach Seamall and so three times a week I park right by T. Winkle, I walk by it and during this process with Bob and Sung I've gotten to kind of look, you know, and see the changes at the park, the good, the bad uh, of what's going on there with those lakes. And so I'm here today to talk to you about the innovative and unique concepts that we came up with together to improve the park in a really beautiful manner, but also do it on budget. And at any time, please feel free to interrupt me. I've got three boards in front of me, but the uh, content is also included in the PowerPoint. So Bob hit most of the stuff. Right on the other side of the fairgrounds, you got a two acres of recirculating waterfalls, lakes. There's an upper lake and a lower lake. It's a very hilly site. And it's kind of a unique opportunity, I think, to kind of send water uphill and watch it come all the way downhill. Uh, highly, highly visited. My kids love it. I've got a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. Uh, the challenge is, unfortunately, that almost every time you go there, your shoes get dirty. And so, you know, one of the challenges that we're trying to overcome with our solution is how do we manage that? And since the park's you know, done in 1965, it was redone in 2004, it's at the end of its uh, service life. The shorelines, the liners, the mechanical, everything needs to be, well, we gotta do this. And there's opportunities for improvements to the aesthetics and the quality of the water. So here's a plan view here on the north is, if you can see my cursor, there it is right there. Uh, essentially, you've got the, the left side or the west side, which is pond one, and you've got the right side, which is pond two. It almost looks like a kidney. And the, the water flows down these beautiful waterfalls, enters lake two, goes over these waterfalls into lake one, gets sucked into the pump station when the pump station's running, and it gets sent along its way. There's really not a lot of treatment that occurs there. On a lot of other lakes that we do, we kind of have a proactive treatment system where the maintenance staff doesn't have to go out there and you know, do all this uh, manual cleaning and chemical addition and try to manage it uh, kind of reactively. We try to proactively uh, approach the project. So there's five improvement opportunities that we see. Number one, fix the shorelines. They're damaged, they're eroded. Number two, we'd like to reshape the system and regrade it and re-landscape the system so that we get deeper water because the deeper the water, the sunlight can't penetrate as much, it's colder, there's a lot less activity and you get clear, better water. Number three, we want to replace the lake liner. You know, looking at how much water loss we've got, water is precious right now, and we're losing a lot of water to seepage through the bottom of the lake. Number four, we think we can make the water relatively clear. I mean, obviously there's always gonna be hundreds of birds at this lake. Kids love geese and ducks, et cetera. You're not gonna get rid of that. So we've gotta manage their excrement and try to treat the best we can and tr hopefully get water clarity of three, four, five feet versus the current six or eight inches that you see now. And then finally, you know, we think we can maybe encourage the waterfall, uh, waterfowl, the birds, to designated areas of the park. 
Uh, you know, you can't control where they're going to go, but you can try to say, hey, this is a better piece of land for you to hang out versus these other pieces and try to keep the sidewalks clean and clear so your shoes are nice and clean. Any questions so far? Okay, thanks. Questions up here. Okay, so I'm just going to show you a few pictures of sort of what's wrong with the place in case you haven't spent time there. We've got tree roots, we've got eroded shorelines, you've got low railings, you've got steep sh uh, shorelines in certain areas, and uh, other kind of damaged shorelines over here. There we go. More shoreline pictures. You can see they're in need of replacement. Exposed pipeline. The old recirculation system used to send water around, and as it does, it has jets at different areas to prevent stagnant water. And unfortunately, over time, the hold downs for those pipes probably got damaged, and those pipes rose up to the surface, and it looks unnatural, right? It looks ugly and unnatural, so we've got to fix that. Waterfowl. I mean, look at the amount of birds that we've got here. They're on the west, they're on the east, they're on the island. They're sort of everywhere. And as you can see, as you walk around, unfortunately, there's a lot of excrement. I know the maintenance staff's out there all the time cleaning it, but within a matter of minutes or hours, it's right back again. And then this is sort of my uh, forte, which is water quality. We went out and we took samples, one from the upper uh, waterfall area, one from the upper lake, one from the lower lake. And we analyzed it for nutrients, oxygen, et cetera. And you can sort of see that you've got extremely high phosphorus. Phosphorus right here in this row should be down around 0.1 milligrams per liter. It's actually 0.9. It's nine times higher than it would be to sort of control the amount of algae in the, in the water. And so therefore, you've got a lot of turbidity. Turbidity is the opposite of clarity. And you've got a lot of that. The pH is high, which means that there's a lot of green growth that's kind of giving off carbonic acid, and so you can kind of see that there's just a lot of biological activity in these lakes. And finally, the existing pump station also requires upgrade improvements. It's just two pumps, end of their uh, service life, there's air in the system, as Bob had mentioned, and there's really very little treatment. So those are the problems at T-Winkle. Now, we talk about the solutions. Five problems, five solutions. We want to deepen the lakes, reline them, and reshape them. We want to rebuild the shorelines with natural edges. We don't want just a man-made looking concrete wall. We want to have stuff as natural as possible, and you can have a nice variety in shoreline edges. Number three, we want to uh, improve the usability and the maintenance access, and we want the edges to be beautiful. Number four, we want to have some sort of treatment component to keep the water quality good. And number five, we have features for the waterfall. So what does a new lake liner look like? You can see this image here on the right. This is a high density polyethylene um, material. It's pliable, but it's also robust. And it uh, doesn't like to be exposed to the sunlight. So it's buried uh, below the surface or below the water surface. And uh, you can sort of mold it around these edges to put planters if you want to. And ultimately, it's completely buried and it's completely waterproof for at least a life of 40 years. And then the shorelines. You know, there's so many different options for shorelines. We want to give you three or four of them on this project. But we want to maximize the amount of vegetation in certain areas. So it gives you not only a blue feel, but also a green feel. And also, uh, by having plants on the shorelines, That'll sort of keep waterfowl from wanting to enter and exit from the areas where those shoreline, uh, shorelines have plants. So now I just wanted to mention two sort of proposed configurations. These are contour maps of the bottom of these lakes. We call them bathymetry maps. It's like an underwater topo. And we want to try to have a safety bench in case anybody were to fall in or obviously be able to get out because it's nice and flat right on the shoreline. But then after that safety bench, it would then slope down at a three to one slope so we can get down as, you know, into deep water. And then at the very, very bottom, uh, that's where your aeration system would go uh, if you had submerged diffused aeration. And we want a lot of volume down at the bottom. So option one is we would get rid of the south or lower lake island that th that's there now. 
and then you would still have this big island between Lake 1 and Lake 2. I mean, um, because that island feature is such a pronounced feature of the park, obviously we want to keep that. We love the island, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to have another small island beneath it. But if it was desired to keep it, this is what it would look like. You'd have a second island, which is there presently, and you'd have a little bit less deep water. So we're recommending option one, but we're open to discussion and both options would work. And then on the main island or the divider between the two, this is where a lot of opportunity exists to sort of encourage the waterfowl to exist. So if you want to hang out with the waterfowl, you're not supposed to feed them obviously, but if you, a lot of the park users like to kind of interact with the waterfowl, this is where that could occur and, and would be encouraged to occur. And so you've got areas where birds would be able to exit and enter the water really easily. And then where the humans sort of enter and exit this center area here, you've got these beautiful natural gabion walls, log walls, um, and planted areas to sort of bifurcate the humans and the waterfowl. Um, and then on the north side here, you've got this beautiful gabion planter wall uh, edge. So there's really not a lot of birds coming in and out of sort of the human side. Um, and so there's many different options and spin-offs of what this would look like, but you see what we're trying to achieve with the design. Here's another example where you've got certain areas of the island that have artificial turf. One of the points that we try to make here is that, um, you know, there's a lot of excrement that we want to keep out of the water. And so if there's a way for maintenance staff to easily go there with a hose bib connection and wash it down to a low point that was uh, something that was easy to maintain and was connected to the sewer, then you've got all that material going to the sewer instead of the lake. And now that phosphorus, instead of being 0.8 or 0.9 milligrams per liter, we can get it down to where it needs to be around 0.1 or 0.2. And so then what's the overarching uh, recirculation pattern, once again, we want to continue to do what was implemented from 1965 and 2004. We want to pump up to the waterfalls. Waterfalls are beautiful. It comes down. But instead of sending all the water equally through the west and the east, we'll actually slow down a little bit of the flow on the west and encourage complete mixing throughout both the upper and the lower lakes by having a, a clockwise pattern right on the upper lake left on the lower lake, and now we're bringing water through the entire system so there's no stagnant zones. And then within the treatment facility, we'll be able to put in coagulants, food grade uh, kind of de-photosynthesis uh, chemicals if we need to. And then thirdly, we can make ozone out of air. We sort of electrocute what's in the air and we make ozone. Ozone is a very easy way to sterilize the water and remove color. Right here on the lower left is the Irvin Magic Johnson Park in Los Angeles, award-winning, it's on LA Times, and we implemented ozone. And what you can see on the left is the lake water before treatment, and then when we started up this system, you get this sort of colorless, odorless water that we send back to the lake. And uh, those systems are you know, pretty much off the shelf. These are some more pictures from that same project, Irvin Magic Johnson Park. As we recirculate the water, it then discharges. You can see this odorless, colorless water. It goes into these vegetated shoreline areas that are in strategic uh, portions of the lake, and then we release that into the main lake. And that would fit within the existing uh, box uh, that's out there on the site or a slight expansion if we needed to. And so once again, that center area that I talked about before, the main island, that's gonna have aquatic planters in certain areas to be a barrier to the waterfowl. The, at Ver Irvin Magic Johnson Park, there are a lot of waterfowl, but they hang out in the lake. They also hang out on strategic areas on the island, and they really don't hang out on the sidewalk areas where you don't want them to. And with that, I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ryan, did you want to add anything else? No, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Awesome. Thank you. At this time, we'll open it up for commissioner questions and comments. I don't have a question, but my computer suddenly switched to the planning commission agenda. <laughs> <laughs> we're back. Okay. Well, that's fun. Yeah.
She's been moved to another commission. Uh, Commissioner Ashenberg, the floor Thank is yours. You. Mr. Comer, that was really interesting. You know, thanks to Mr. Ryan, I've been exposed to more information on tree roots than I ever thought possible, and today the same with, with water. And this is really exciting. It really is exciting. So I spent um, all... <laughs> Sorry. But I can, thank you, I can speak loudly. So um, a couple of questions. There was um, on the Lake One Island that you're referring to. Now that has roughly five trees on it. It's, so th that's the one that we would retain those trees and that island as is. Is that correct? That's correct. The okay. one that has access for, for the public with the bridges, those, those would all remain intact. Okay, and then there's there's a, a picture, I think it's uh, on page 26, of shoreline roots. And so um, what, what do you do to remove those or to keep those in line? Yeah, thank you. If I could help respond to that, Rob, if you'd like to. So, yeah, I mean, that, that is a challenge, right? Well, those are beautiful trees. We want to retain those trees. Mm -hmm. And so... We think we're gonna be able to expand the shoreline just a little bit further into the water. We're gonna lose a little bit of water and then we'll be able to sort of backfill with soil to give the roots a place to go and then also go up a little bit higher so we can sort of submerge the roots with soil and then slope down and make it look natural. Obviously those roots are gonna grow over time again and they're gonna to start to pop up again, but it will buy us you know, hopefully a decade or more of time. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Brown, you have the floor. This must be my fault too. <laughs> now my mic won't go off. <laughs> you have a question, you can, oh, all right, there you go. Thank you for that presentation. Um, can you talk us through uh, your preference for option one over option two? Uh, I understand, uh, I mean, my sense of what I might hear right now has to do with depth of water and water quality and visibility, but I'd be curious if I'm reading that correctly and then what, what your analysis is in terms of why option one over uh, option two. Sure, I, th Thank I think it's a tough call and a lot of it's gonna be personal preference, right? If you look at this park, it's a big park. What did you say, 60 or so acres, I think, Rob, earlier, 70 acres? And there's only two acres of water. And so we don't have a lot, of, a lot of water to work with, and it's sort of a small focal piece already. And we wanna make that water look as big as it can and also be as deep and clear as it can. And so we've already got an island that's, that divides this two acre lake into two little pieces. And now you'd be subdividing a piece of a piece. And then you're unable to sort of get deep because you have to ramp up and wrap down like a roller coaster. Um, so I understand that, you know, people like that island. We've, you know, a couple other trees, I believe, on that island, and there's birds on that island as well. You can't get to it. Uh, but if you look at the pros and the cons, it just seems like you're better off with two nice lakes with a nice island in the middle. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Uh, Commissioner Dern Parker. Thank you. So I have a couple, four areas. And my perspective is my sons, we went there a lot. Um, so a couple things that I really appreciate is the shelf, uh, having both children run headlong into those chasing ducks back in the 90s, that, that I can't imagine. We, and I saw other children do the same. So I really appreciate that understanding of having that shelf 
because that doesn't exist. So that was pretty scary for a lot of us parents Absolutely. as the kids. I mean, the kids were, yeah, smelly, gross stuff. So um, I can't get to the presentation, but I think on page 4.4, talked about in the duck feeding area, it looked like there was like planks. Um, is that for the ducks or is that something that the people can walk across? Um, again, my perspective is small kids running around in the park, enjoying all the amenities, but um, knowing kind of how... Um, how courageous they are around the water and trying to chase the fowl. That's right. So that, great question. And we are under progress as far as design goes. We okay. wanted to take into consideration your recommendations. That's going to be the most challenging and tricky part of the whole project, obviously. Yeah. I did a lousy job maybe explaining it, and Rob can help me here a little bit. But there's a sidewalk on the north side that exists today. Yeah. We're going to keep that nice wide sidewalk. Okay. Hopefully we can keep that thing relatively clean. So just on the south side of that sidewalk, we would have some kind of a beautiful natural barrier. Okay. And it would be a combination of gabions and logs and rail or whatever it happens to be. Okay. And then the birds would be ho hopefully on the other side of that that they could, you know, look at. And you mentioned feeding. Um, and then on the north side, you know, you're not going to have a lot of birds hopefully entering and exiting because of the aquatic vegetation. Of going over so, there. Yeah, and it's not going to be perfect, but it'll be No, better. no, no. Yeah. And, I, and I know that we, um, we have a lot of residents and visitors who, who really enjoy feeding the fowl, even right. when the signs ask not to. So is that the idea is to maybe herd that sort of connectivity that a lot of our visitors have to the fowl? to try to keep it more mitigated versus? I mean, I think that that's sort of my dream, okay. you know, is that they, they're not going to be everywhere anymore. They're not okay. going to be on the surrounding perimeter that's... of the lake. And, um, you know, hopefully they'll want to go where we want them to go. Okay, perfect. Um, then the other thing I had is I really appreciate not having that island in the middle because that's a, my kids and some of their friends thought that would be really cool to jump in and try to swim there. Wow, interesting. Um, which is kind of, and if you, you know, I have, a, yeah, I had very active sons and they still right. are, which is wonderful and very creative right. and loved the picnic areas and the waterfalls coming down. So I appreciate all the conversations, but that's from my perspective of understanding how the kids are really using it. So I really appreciate having some safety issues instead of having fencing around it, which is not natural. I really appreciate that thought process. Um, so that's the, so that's kind of my perspective, but it's mine because of what that Island represented was a challenge to get there versus I like the idea of having, I know very unique what, yeah, what my boys and a lot of their friends would think. Um, uh, yeah, having a minivan full of young children rollerblading and things. It's its a wonderful park. It's amazing asset for our community, but has some challenges also with how much and different ways they use it. So that's my perspective. So if that, that really helps. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, are there any other commissioner? Yeah, uh, Commissioner Ashenor. If you could just um, address a couple of the disadvantages that are outlined in the um, proposal. When you say, uh, we know, obviously, we understand that the lake is going to have to be drained. Could you talk, and the fowl, and th all of those are going to have to be moved? The timing, how long that's going to occur for upsetting the nature of the park? Sure. Yeah, Rob, you can help me with this as well. But we obviously want to be very strategic about that. And if we're able to do it in the dry season, potentially it coincides right. with your fiscal year, uh, mm -hmm. that might be a good thing. And we would hopefully be able to shut down one side at a time. We're going to develop a very detailed sequence of construction. And they'll be able to sort of transfer water from point A to point B and drain it out and dredge it. There's ways of putting different chemicals on, like lime, for example, to keep odors down. Mm -hmm. And we just have to, you know, carefully specify all those things through the design process. Okay. And I, do, I just wanted to comment that in the proposal you talk about taking advantage of some repairs that, that may be cosmetic but will be beneficial in the long run. So I really appreciate seeing that in the report as well. Good. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, at this point, I'll save my comments and we'll open this item up for public comment for any members of the public to weigh in. Um, we will 
now open, there's nobody in the chamber, so if there's anybody on Zoom to make a public comment, please raise your hand using the raise hand feature or press star nine if you're on your phone and star six when prompted to speak. Uh, Ms. Fatua, are there any members of the public? If there are any members, please raise your hand. Chair, I see no hands raised. Thank you, Ms. Fatua. At this point, we'll close public comments on this item. Uh, for any additional commissioner questions or comments. Um, I just wanted to echo what's already been said. I, I appreciate the care and attention that's already gone into this. Um, it's clear that went into this report, and I'm sure it's exciting for you as a resident to get to work on something that your kids are gonna be enjoy. So that's, that's definitely um, wonderful to see. So I just had a few questions. Uh, the old liner of the lake um, was that, was the liner that's currently damaged or leaking, was that installed in 2004 as part of the renovation work done in that period? Yeah, I, bl I believe that portion was, none of, none of the streams or the smaller ponds were, but the lake liner was partially done, yes. In 2004, right. gotcha. So if the lake liner was done in 2004, what was the advertised lifespan on the liner put in in 2004? I can help with that. I mean, so I knew you were going there. That was a great question. It's because I just mentioned that we're going to have a 40-year life, and we only had a 20-year life, right? Well, I'm guessing that that liner system was probably done as a repair instead of a complete replacement. We're talking about regrading, reshaping, redoing the thing from scratch, like when you knock down a house versus renovating, hmm. number one. Number two, liners have come a long way. I mean, the specifications on PVC and RPE and 24 mil and 36 mil, et cetera, they pretty much have it nailed down now. So we use either you know, 24 or 36 mil, mil which is a certain uh, thickness, and it's reinforced and it's very pliable. You can actually take a rock and sort of push on it hard and it doesn't break. And so this stuff lasts a lot longer than it used to. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and, I, and I noticed one of the comments was that you know, maybe one thing that could potentially affect it out of the 30 to 50 year lifespan would be vandalism or damage to the liner. Have you seen that occur? What does that look like when that occurs? Where the safety shelf is, we coat the top of the plastic liner with a veneer, concrete veneer, and that would keep somebody from taking a stick, for example, and penetrating that. If somebody really wanted to, you know, they could maybe get into the lake in the deep zone where it's dangerous and do something, but that, Hard, you know, I haven't really seen that happen. Okay, that, that's yeah. reassuring. Um, the, the next comment I wanted to make is about trees, mm -hmm. because we all love trees on this commission. Um, and just to preface my comments, um, it has historically been an issue with community members when, if there is a proposal to remove any trees in any parks, so just fair warning there. Um, so with that being said, I noticed the, the tree along the side of the lake was used in one of the photos um, with the roots kind of fanning out almost like a natural barrier on the side of the lake. Um, so I'm wondering, could it not be said that those roots help create some kind of natural barrier on the lake? I mean, is there a health and safety reason for why that tree has to go or is it more of an aesthetic uh, concern for that tree on the side of the lake? I'm not sure which tree that is, Rob. The ones in the island we're gonna keep, but go ahead, Rob. Yeah, there's, there, I don't believe there's, was there trees in one of the fingers that came out that were going to be removed? Oh, not, yeah, maybe. That could be the case, yes. That could be the case. Yeah, so yes. there's probably a couple on to, in order to reshape the lake to That's get right. that flow and to get that depth. Um, it looks like there may be one or two smaller trees on one of those outlets that, that, would, that would have to be removed for that. That's right. Gotcha. That that just jumped out at me when I was reading, and I saw that there might be some trees removed. Um, yeah, all the ones on the island will stay. As a matter of fact, most of the, most of the other ones, we're going to be expanding. Uh, the idea is to expand the shoreline and give them a little bit more room to grow and a bit healthier of an area. Uh, and as Mr. Comer mentioned, adding some soil to them. Uh, but in order to create that depth and also uh, one of the pluses of removing the island is for water flow, and that's also the plus of reshaping it. Um, everywhere you have what we call in the maintenance, the fingers, where the, the land that comes out into the middle of the water 
and it goes back in. Uh, that creates little dead zones where it's really hard to get the water to circulate naturally. Uh, you get a, a huge buildup of, of issues there. Um, so straightening that out a little bit, giving a little bit more uh, fluidity to the flow, it, it, it helps. So a great deal of benefit to that. Yeah, thank you. That, I totally forgot to present that. So in the uh, southeast corner of the lower lake, there are two fingers. They're full of scum and foam and algae, and you just can't get to it. It's really a nasty part. We're getting rid of that by scra uh, scraping out those fingers and making a nice um, sinusoidal curve. I appreciate the explanation. Um, I'll still say I'll, I'll personally probably express my you know reservations about removal to the tree but okay um you are the experts not me so um also uh, on just a, a a personal comment on the aesthetic design um i really love as vice chair already met, others have mentioned the use of the stone gabions i think that's a brilliant design it looks really nice um uh, just conversely, though, in the in the same spirit of you know wanting to protect tree trees and you know put out that message that we care about and love our trees in the city, um, it might it you know some people might get a weird message or a weird feel to see you know uh, chopped wood used as an aesthetic in the park. Okay. Um, maybe we could use rocks instead of chopped wood, unless it's of course a, an actual tree in the park that's repurposed. But <laughs> that's an important symbolism, yeah. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, so just being mindful of that symbolism, and I appreciate your attention to that. Um, and then just a question uh, out of ignorance on the pump systems and the ozone and, and the design of that. Um, when the water is cleared, is there any, the, the remaining silt or uh, dirt or whatever you would call it, what happens to that discharge? Where does it go? Is it toxic? Or could you maybe comment a little bit more about that? That's a great question. Yeah, so I mean, you've already got a lot of silt and suspended solids in the lake currently, and that settles out into the main body of the lake. So when we go in to do this construction, there's going to be several free feet of what I call muck in the bottom already. So instead of letting it accumulate there, we will strategically discharge that through the lower recirculation system into those vegetated planters on the edge. And as you saw in that Irvin Magic Johnson photo, there's a large pipe that it comes out of. It comes out at slow diameter, so that will actually fill with this silt over years and years and years. And when you want to get it out, you want to dredge it out, you can just get to the shoreline and easily pull it out without having to dewater the entire lake. So we strategically sort of keep it on the wetland planters on the sides of the lake. Yeah, please, Vice Chair, go ahead. So, um, thank you. I'm uh, sorry, thank you all for your patience <laughs> no, as I get this fine. down. <laughs> <laughs> it's all my fault, so remember that, it's not your fault. Um, so when you talk about the silt, when you, you're talking about re-engaging what is existing there, sort of pushing it around to be part of the new versus trying to pull it out. We're and... going to remove all the silt as part of the construction. So you're going to start with a brand new swimming pool, basically. And, th and then over time, unfortunately, because of all the mother nature, you'll start to get it again. Right. But we're always trying to remove it as fast as we can to get that clear water. So what's going to happen to all the muck that's in there right now? Because you'll be, is, do you... Um, wh where does that get disposed? That's a great question. We're so, trying yeah, to recycle, reuse that sort of... Our sister company actually does lakes construction. Their name is Pacific Aquascape. They've been doing okay. it for a long time. They actually did the renovation over by the Costa Mesa Country Club off of uh, Adams, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. They had a, an absurd amount of muck in that system, and it okay. was right next to high-density housing. They were actually able to lime treat it, so they put lime down to kind of stabilize the odors, et cetera, and they pump it through what's called a geotube bag, so all the water leaves the bag, and you can kind of concentrate up the sludge or the muck into a really hard, dense, you know, mass. And then they take that, and they take it to either land application or landfill. So okay. it's part of the construction uh, cost. Of the cost set. So there is a portion that will be going to landfill. Right. Okay. Are, are okay. you asking as well, I'm sorry, uh, Vice Chair Jordan Park, are you asking as, as far as the maintenance after the fact as well, well or are you just concerned about the construction Sort of aspect? as we go through construction as, as if, the, you know, um, how to put it. I know nothing about construction, so this will tell me ignorance. But I do know sometimes when you pull elements out of the ground, sometimes you can move them to other construction sites or other areas that needs the, the nutrients. 
Uh, but I know this muck isn't like a compost. It's, there's no nutrients that you it, could It grow has against. a lot of nutrients in it, but yeah. Yeah, yeah I was so. just going to say there, there may be, in our maintenance operations, more than likely, um, we'd be pulling that material out of the, uh, the clean out and right. probably inserting that into uh, where some of our, our waste is collected from the street sweeping system. And, and our, our contractor for street sweeping does uh, compost. Oh, they do. Uh, so a, a, a majority a high majority of the high material majority. they pull out. So there, there may be even some opportunity when we get into the construction to look at options to, to composting uh, the yeah. material that's removed. And of course, we'd have to work that out with the contractor, but there's some opportunities I think that we can look and into. I, and I know there's more composting available in the county that was even just three, four years ago. And, and we do have some state requirements that, that, that we right. need to look at and meet. So this would be a good opportunity to meet Same. some of those state requirements. So it's definitely something we'll be looking at. And ongoing, it sounds like with the new system, when the muck builds up, there'll be an easier way to remove it on an ongoing basis that can be more easily reused and compost right. so that we don't end up with this huge amount of muck. Correct. If I'm okay. not mistaken, it, it stays in those... Those it cylinders, those and cylinders. It's, it's easy to take a, a piece of equipment, like a tractor truck, and, and, to, and, and pull to it that. out and, and transport it to a place where it can be uh, later composted. That's great. Thank you. I agree with Rob's I, I answer. I interrupted by the way. you, so yeah. go ahead and keep going. I just have one quick question at the end. No, those were good questions. I, you saw where I was going with those questions about discharge, so you took it. Um, those are all my questions. Great presentation. Be good. Thank you. Any? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Oops. So as we know, our assembly will actually, it was our state senator who provides funding. Is this the project that that's part of the $10 million um, that state senator men provided in this next budget that will offset out of the city budget to pay for this renovation? Or is that in addition to a different project? This, this project was not a part of the the recently approved senator money or assemblywoman money. Because there was a part on there that was Fairview, but it's not this project of Fairview. The, the T. Winkle was in reference to the sports. I mean, T. Winkle, I'm sorry. T. Winkle, yeah, was in reference. Field improvements, specifically lighting, mm -hmm. energy efficient lighting. Lighting, energy. So it wasn't anything to do with this project? No, the Lakes was a pre funded project from okay. earlier CIPs. I just wanted to make sure that we clarified that because, of course, when everyone hears all this money in the different parks, they, you know. So, okay, thank you. Awesome. Uh, well, I don't know that there's an action item for us on this item other than just to um, have you consider that feedback. So thank you for your time. Uh, Mr. Ryan, did you have anything you wanted to end with? No, that was, there's no action item. Just re we're receiving your input and, and your recommendations um, and taking that back. We appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, with that, we will go to the next item on the agenda. Uh, new business item C is consideration of an application from Mesa Group Real Estate for a Music in the Park event to be held on October 1st, 2022 at Balearic Park. I will start. Uh, Ms. Fatua will also be assisting me with this item as she is uh, working on special events permits that come into our department. Um, much like the cyclocross, which is an event that we brought before the commission um, a few months ago, anytime we have kind of a new or irregular type of special event that could impact the neighborhood, uh, we would likely be bringing it before the commission just to review and give the community, the neighbors surrounding the park, an opportunity to weigh in, to share their feedback, comments, concerns. Um, the application has been received. Staff are in a continuous dialogue. There was also supplemental information, uh, an email that was received from the applicant uh, in which the date has been postponed. So as a uh, chairperson read, the date of the original item does not match the current date, and they are still trying to lock in the musical entertainment. Um, so what we're really here to do is, is just talk about the concept of having a, you know, a non-city offered concert. Uh, it has been requested before, but we had never gotten one this far. There is or could be noise impacts to the neighbors. We would obviously be working with them, with the, the organizers, to try to mitigate any impacts noise-wise or other 
to the neighbors, the surrounding neighbors, which way they point the spinkers, the stage, what time they start, what time they end, set up, clean up, all of those things from start to finish. So it's you know one of the big noise complaints that we get for special events has nothing to do with the event itself other than setup, things like big trucks backing up, the beep, beep, beep. So that, those are all things that we take into consideration before approving any special event request. Uh, all special events, all applications do go before all departments. So there's usually a representative from each department, police, fire, public works, planning, uh, that review special event applications as well. Um, so again, the, tonight's discussion is to really engage the public. Um, if Ms. Fatua wants to add anything about this one, most of the information is in your packet. Uh, you know, we're supportive of it. It's a free program that they are wanting to offer to the community. Uh, you know, we we appreciate when some of the, the businesses in our city, you know, do contribute, whether it be by sponsoring a city hosted event, those are our favorite, where we get to help supply all of the fun and they can just help defray the costs like we've done for the movies in the park. Um, but, you know, I'm in support of this, provided we get public input um, here tonight. So with that, Ms. Fatua, anything to add? Not at this time. Uh, we do have Mesa Group Real Estate um, uh, in attendance, and so she has a little presentation. Uh, Whitney Frenzel will be um, talking, so I'm going to give her the floor. Give me one moment. She's attending via Zoom for everyone. Okay. Whitney? Can you hear me okay? Yes. We can, thank you, welcome. So we do have a presentation and she'll just be the audio, so. Yes, here we go. Um, my name is Whitney Frenzel and I am the marketing director for Mesa Group Real Estate. And I just wanted to thank you for giving us a little bit of time tonight to present our special event proposal. Um, we can go down, I'll give you a little overview about who we are and um, just some details about the event. Um, you can go, you can skip a couple of slides, slides please. There we go. And then one more, please. other direction, sorry, there we go, perfect, thanks. Um, we are a boutique real estate firm, um, an independent firm, and we are in Costa Mesa, just outside of Mesa Verde. And we are hyper, hyper local focused um, in that neighborhood. And um, we've been there working in the neighborhood for about 10 years, but we've recently opened an independent brokerage. Um, so this will be a little bit of a reintroduction to the community. Um, we're just really proud to have worked here for, a lo for so long, and it's a really special place, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, yeah, and then we can go to the next slide. We have always been hyper-community focused. We, um, you can go to the next slide, too. Um, we offer multiple community events throughout the year. Um, we do food drives for neighborhoods. We do twice annual garage sales holiday events. We just did a 4th of July party and we do a Halloween party and other events. And we just love providing opportunities for making memories um, and for giving back, obviously, too. I think a lot of people want to give back, but it's a lot easier to do that when someone provides a means to do that. So um, we really love doing that year after year. This is a little bit different, um, but we're excited for the opportunity for that as well. So we can go to the next slide. And then one more. Um, so this is the proposed event details. We did have to change the date to October 1st because our band, we lost our previous date. They were unavailable. Um, it would be a G-rated family show. Um, they're really fun and funny and we feel like it would be really a fun time for the community. Um, like I said, fam totally family appropriate. Um, we're proposing from 5 to 7 p.m. We do have amplified music and we have four of the quiet generators that we would be using. So they're, they're the ones that you don't require additional permits for. So it should be relatively quiet. 
obviously the neighbors will hear the music. So um, we have adjusted our floor plans for the park so that all the amplified music is going into the hills instead of into the backyards. And we will have one food truck um, providing food for purchase. And then we will have free concessions and other goodies that we would just offer free to the, to the neighbors. Um, I think the main thing that I would say is that this is a small neighborhood event. It's not going to be open to the public. Of course, if you're at the park, you're welcome to enjoy the music. Um, but the only people who will be receiving an invitation are people who live in the Mesa Verde neighborhood. So we will be hand delivering those invitations to those people and then obviously notifying them of the event two weeks prior to let them know about the sound um, possible nuisances. <laughs> and then we would give them a phone number for someone to talk to if they had any issues on the day of the event. And yeah, I think we can go to the next slide. This is a site map proposal. You can see that the stage and all of the speakers would be facing towards the hills. Um, and then, like I said, this, so the invitations will be going out to this immediate neighborhood where the park is. So ideally, we like the idea of people walking to the park if they are physically able to do that. Um, and if not, there's um, parking on Boa Vista Drive. And we're also in conversation with the local church to possibly utilize their parking as an additional overflow if it's necessary. Um, we will have trash cans throughout the event, obviously to aid in a quick cleanup at the end of the event. And um, we're hoping to use the restroom facilities at the recreation facility right there next to the parking area. We only need a few vendor parking spots um, for the band for us, and then maybe one or two others. And that's it with that. We can go to the next one and maybe one more. We, like I said, we have always had a community focus. So we always wanna give back. We love hosting events. Um, people love it. I feel like we've gotten so much out of this community and it's a really wonderful place. And it's our honor and privilege to give back to them. Um, so extending our personal gratitude and then encourage community gathering. I think that's something that in the last couple of years, we've all felt a growing need for. And I think a renewed appreciation for when you saw your neighbors walking around the streets and um, you really got to know them in 2020. So um, just taking that another step further and, and offering people an easy opportunity to come and have a nice weekend evening in the fall with their family. So that's our hope. And um, again, we really appreciate all of your time. And Laura, I really appreciate all your help. <laughs> and um, yeah, we'd love to hear any questions if anyone has any. If I could just follow up on that. Thank you, um, Whitney, for you know giving us a little bit more information about the event. Uh, like most special events, there is a quite a bit of dialogue back and forth between staff and the applicants. Uh, there were some concerns that staff had that we would be trying to address. Um, the first one, um, as the event was pushed back from September to October, sunset I believe is 6.36 p.m. I looked it up, so we might want to talk about adjusting that end time um, so that it you know, is over before dark to make it easier for people to leave. Uh, the restrooms is is somewhat of a concern, not knowing the exact crowd size. And, you know, one of the things that staff had brought up um, in reviewing this potential permit was, you know, these bands sometimes through social media have quite a following. And, uh, you know, the bands are all about getting their fans out. So we would want to work with the, the applicant on trying to make sure that they had a parking plan in place, traffic plan in place, so that you know if there was a bigger crowd than expected, you know we, we usually don't like to tell people they can't come to free events, yeah. um, you know whether they were invited or not. And one of the things that we don't typically allow at our parks is you know s big events like this that would not be op available to the public. So you know by ticket only or anything like that, we try to discourage. So uh, with that, we'll turn it over to the commission. You know both Laura and I are here to answer questions. If you have questions of the applicant, you're welcome to do that, or turn it over for a public comment to see if anyone is, uh, is here from the public to speak on the matter. 
in prep, we did have a, a social media post go out and um, signs were posted at the park notifying the public of tonight's meeting in case anyone had concerns they'd like to share and join us. That's it. Uh, thank you, Director Minter, and uh, thank you, Ms. Fretzel. Uh, are there any commissioner comments or questions? Uh, commissioner Brown, the floor is yours. Thank you for that. Um, I actually have a question for uh, city staff and Director Mentor, you in particular. Is so, um, and then a comment. H how typical is it for you all to see proposals for events like this that are um, invitation only and very geared to one particular community within Costa Mesa? Is this something? How common is it? Uh, we don't get very many. Well, there's there's been other real estate based support, um, this, there's the Snowland that takes place at Balearic um, every winter. You know, that's been an ongoing event since I've been here, so we didn't bring it before commission. So there are some, you know, long-standing events. Uh, none of them that I know are, are limited, you know, to, you know, the public where it's by invitation only. Uh, of the special events that we do process, many of them don't take place at parks. It's on private property or public right of way. And if they're closing streets, there's a process that they have to follow. Um, but, you know, for the most part, if, if it's a private business having one, yeah, those would be limited to their employees. But when it comes to public space, public parks, uh, obviously, if you're getting a, you know, a hundred person picnic permit at T. Winkle Park for a birthday party or, or whatever, it's going to be limited to the, the family or friends that you invite. But, you know, this takes it out of that realm of a picnic permit and into a special event where it is not something that we typically approve. No. Thank you for that. And, you know, I just want to say I'm in support of having more cultural events and music in the park. So I, I would always want to support that. But I do have a little bit of a concern, actually, um, that uh, when the presenter talked about how this would be by invitation only to a to a public space at one of our parks. Um, and just wanna acknowledge that, you know, we have a real housing issue in Costa Mesa. And in addition to having a housing issue where, you know, most houses go for a million plus, um, in some districts, mine for example, we don't have as many parks, like from where I live in District 5, there aren't that many parks for us to walk to. And so I guess I have a little bit of hesitation supporting an event. I, I would support having music in the park, but I would want to second the city staff concern that this needs to be open to the public. I would want to make sure that if we're going to host this event, that it would be advertised as any of the other events are advertised so that people in all of Costa Mesa would feel comfortable going to see this band. It sounds exciting. Mm -hmm. And I think that especially as we acknowledge some of the challenges that we have in Costa Mesa, I would be very, very uncomfortable um, making it seem as though some events are only open to those who can afford homes in particular neighborhoods. So that's, that's my concern, but thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Brown. Uh, Commissioner Ashendorf, the floor is yours. Is it, oh, thanks. I think we have it, okay. Um, since it's being moved to October 1st, is there any conflict with what goes on at the Adobe um, and pushing back the hour? I know the Adobe generally is open on the first and third Saturdays. Is That was something I'd, I thought I'd throw out for you. So depending on the time frame, yeah. um, for that specific location, it's lower yes. at Phalaric. Yes. So technically, it, there wouldn't be any conflicts, but we can definitely be coordinating with um, the Historical Society just to ensure that there's no conflicts for that specific date. Great, and a clarification, the food truck then would be on the basketball court, is that correct? Is that how I, I view that on the map? Okay, and um, I do appreciate the conversation with the church across from um, Adams if that were to be the case, it would be really important to have crossing guards or some kind of police because Adams is quite a busy street and to get people to go from there to the park would be um, a bit dangerous. And then um, there will be no alcohol served, I assume. Is that correct? And then finally, are there adequate bicycle racks 
um, in the lower part there at Balearic. Thank you. So yes, the the crossing guard, the safety, that would be part of the traffic plan. Any identified parking spaces or parking lots, we would want to make sure they had a way to get people safely across. Your point about Adams is is one that we had already, you know, started our discussion on. Um, you had asked about, man, I was going to remember them all. What's that? Yes, no alcohol will be allowed, is, is allowed in our parks, um, and we'll make sure the, the park rangers are aware of the event. And again, that's part of the review process um, for the application is sending it through planning and, and development services, and they can help make suggestions on the traffic plan and, and getting people safely to and from the park. Thank you, Commissioner Ashendorf. Are there any other commissioner comments? Commissioner Vallarta, go ahead. To the, um, I'm sorry, the, the speaker from um, the real estate organization. Um, I guess, you know, piggybacking off of the comments from uh, Commissioner Brown, what's your rationale on, on limiting it to just that surrounding neighborhood? Yeah, thank you for the question. I definitely wanted to address this. I, maybe I didn't say it properly, but it's definitely not by invitation only. Anyone is welcome to come to the event, any Costa Mesa resident. No one's gonna show up at the tour with the ticket. There's no, where do you live sort of review process when you're coming. Mainly our reason for advertising it to a smaller area was to keep it honestly, not a very large event, just a smaller scale event. Um, so there's just like less nuisance to the neighbor neighbors. Again, if you're having people come from all over the city, we were just hoping for a smaller event, but it's not by invitation only. There are no tickets. It's totally free and anyone is welcome to come. But like, for example, the band is a privately paid for band. They will not be doing any advertising. It would just be us. Mainly the concern was keeping the event from getting too large. So not advertising it all over Costa Mesa, but it's not by invitation only. Thank you. Does that, hopefully that clarifies. Yes, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Vice Chair Dorn Parker. Thank you. Um, kind of on that same line, um, I, I would, I don't know how to put this. Um, I think when you have a concert in a public park, and I know that the company will be advertising it through their, you know, through the small area that they seem to be marketing to Mesa Verde, uh, I'm a little concerned that um, to, to believe that a concert um, in a park where our city is used to having concerts in the park where everyone will be arriving and lots of fun stuff going on. So I'd love to see the city staff work with the um, private business to understand what happens um, and not just the parking for the planning, but how are they going to plan to have if the whole community comes out? Because it's, it's a beautiful park. It's a beautiful area. Um, it's on the edge of Costa Mesa. I do know a lot of people in Huntington Beach actually come over to our concerts. So that's my only concern is um, to plan for such a small intimate event in a public space that has a, just sounds like an incredible band available. And if it's Habit food truck, I mean, those are so popular. Um, that's my only concern, I think. And I, and I really appreciate uh, Director Mentor talking about the time of sunset, that that's a, that becomes more and more of an issue, especially as you get more of a, the city where people are walking or riding their bikes is to have an earlier band, you know, band ending time and, and that kind of stuff. So those are my sort of piggybacking on that is sort of um, being in a public space, having a concert in a park that's public that from a city that's very much appreciates these, these musical events in public spaces. Um, I think the good side is you're going to have a lot of people interested, especially that band is a really fun band, it sounds like. So that, those are my concerns for staff. So thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. And uh, Commissioner Brown, go ahead. Thank you all. Um, I do want to raise the... I want to raise the topic that I actually think 
there's some precedent going on here. And I want to imagine that it's we're going to see these moving forward where they're very hyper neighborhood focused. And I'm just curious how we will deal with that. I'm curious about what that means for those neighborhoods where real estate agencies or other businesses don't want to hold events, right? Will they want to hold them all over the city? Or are we giving our time and resources for certain neighborhoods where investors are interested in hosting events? So I want us to be prepared to think about that, that it's maybe not just this one time. And then I also just want to acknowledge that it's one thing to say you don't need a ticket, and it's another thing to say it's open and we're welcoming all and we're going to make sure that everyone hears about this. It is a sort of, um, I might not use the word discrimination, but um, there is a sort of implicit um, segregation or separation that's happening. So I'm, I'm not convinced based upon the comments that I've heard that this will be open to all in the sense that events are open to all. When city staff make sure that we have events open to all, it goes out in materials, it's on social media, people are encouraged to talk about it. So um, for me, I'm actually even more um, concerned that this is an event that I, I don't feel comfortable supporting um, unless it is truly open to all, which needs to go out through all of the official channels, which then means it could be a larger event, which I think would be a sign of success, right? That you would open your neighborhood up to others from outside. And I guess that is also perhaps my perspective as a Costa Mesa resident is that I want to feel like all neighborhoods are open to me and that I can go to them. I would want that in my neighborhood for others. So um, I guess that those are the end of my comments. Well said, Commissioner. Uh, Vice Chair Dorn Parker. Um, it's interesting, Commissioner Brown, you said that. Um, I'm the old lady in the room that's been here a long time, and the city used to have a band shell, and then they bought a few more, and they used to plop them at different parts of the city. Um, and so, like, on the east side, they would have it at, like, I think they had it at Kaiser and at Harper, and then they had it over in Mesa Verde, and then they had it, they shut down some streets on the west side. So there was this sort of moving around and opportunities, and they had different businesses that did sponsor it. I don't even think that band shell, it's like was on the back of a truck, and it would plop down, and sometimes it broke down, and it's, it was supposed to have electricity, and a couple times that, that, that we were using it um, with in conjunction with youth sports and having, you know, like um, we had some little bands playing, but we also had different demonstrations. So there is a there is sort of a history in the city of having these smaller events but making them available to everybody in the city but also having multiple events so every parts of our community north coast mesa um where i'm just trying to think oh i just forgot we're north of the 405 freeway they have you know that really lovely that wimbledon area so they came to ours and then they saw theirs um so there is a precedence historically for doing something like this but like you said um it's making me nervous that it's it's at a it's at a particular neighborhood that planning is going to be limited instead of open to everybody and explain and because the I mean how um, generous of the company to have a community event but then I think it should really be a full community event for the whole city so thank you but there is a precedent where they where they did have different events throughout the city with their little band shells. If I might, um, you know, recent memory, we haven't had a, a concert at Balearic um, of any type. However, part of the arts and culture master plan did include the, the future purchase of a showmobile or a modern day truck with a band shell um, in which we are exploring opportunities to, you know, take the concerts on the road. Uh, when, when staff consider any location for a movie in the park, for a concert in the park, it, it, you know, the basic questions are, is there suitable restrooms for the public? Is there parking that's not going to impact neighbors? Yes, when we move park or movies in the park from park to park, you know, we do try to target different neighborhoods if we can. Um, but we also consider, want to make sure we consider the, the appropriate parks for this space. There's a small parking lot at Balearic. There's the parking lot up at Estancia. Other than that, there's you know street parking right along the park, but there is you know could be considerable impact on any larger type event. Now we know that it's been ongoing for the the um, the snow event that takes place, also sponsored by a realtor. 
Um, so it, it's you know really not about the vendor. It's about you know the city has a great deal of experience. Our staff in putting these things together. And you know I'm sorry, Commissioner, I forgot your question. The bike racks, having things like bike racks available would most likely need to be rented or constructed. Um, I'm guessing that the restrooms would not be satisfactory for there. So we would be asking them to to bring in portable restrooms. Uh, you know the logistics for events like this is all, oftentimes a lot greater than than what people expect you know it's more than just music the concerns about you know portable generators do they have the capacity to uh to you know cover what the wattage is needed by the amps guitars whatever and so that would be something that we would also want to review with the applicant so you know conceptually you know i think there's merit to this application um, i would encourage you chairperson to get public impact and then you know we can come back before the commission and hear any more thoughts on your end um, but one of the goals in this was to hear from the public, and I think we have people online, but I'm not sure if they're intending to speak on, on this item. Uh, thank you for that nudge, Director Mentor. So let's move on to public comment now. Um, Ms. Fatua, um, we don't have anybody in the chamber, but we will open this item up to public comment for anybody on Zoom. If you would like to public comment, you can use the raise hand option. Uh, and press star nine if you're on your phone and star six if you're on your phone when prompted to speak. Uh, so Ms. Fatua, is there anybody to make a public comment? If there's anyone from the public who wishes to speak regarding this item, please raise your hand. Chair, I see no hands raised. Thank you, Ms. Fatua. Um, at this point, then, we will close public comment. Um, I, I just wanted to pick up on a thread that's already been raised, because um, I, I appreciate the comments that have been made. Um, uh, Ms. Fretzel, I appreciate your patience, too. Um, maybe just to summarize, I think, you know, if I live in the neighborhood and I'm walking by a public park and I see something happening at the park, whatever it is, the expectation is that it's a public park, that this activity is for the community, it's open to the public, and that's the purpose of our park. So I, I would certainly support this only moving forward, um, and that, that being the policy for our public parks. Um, a question for staff, what is the, I didn't see it on the application, and some boxes are blacked out, what is the total fee amount charged to the applicant for this event? Uh, the fee is, in, there's a, a usually an application fee of $425. Uh, it's typically a $25 deposit with the, you know, a $400 payment. Um, if there are other costs or charges or staff or anything, that, that fee can go up. Um, so each special event may vary depending on you know, what all they're asking or what all space they need. It may also require additional permits from other departments upon the review. So if there's, you know, constructing a stage or having, you know, larger tents constructed or things like that, there can be, you know, permit fees from planning or building or fire that would be charged later on. Okay, thank you for that, Director Mentor and Ms. Fatua. Um, and then I know you already touched on this, Jason, but just to ask again specifically, um, what, how was this noticed to residents and neighbors? Um, it was placed out um, on the playground area and then the Balearic Community Center, uh, specifying that today was a public notice and then the agenda posting as well. Okay. Um, well, I guess personally, I'm really comfortable with this. I want people to feel, I want anybody in Costa Mesa to feel like they can come forward. If they have a cool idea for something they want to do in the park, let's hear it. Let's, let's see it. Um, that's what I think we're all about in our parks. So I'm going to move to uh, approve the staff recommendation with the, uh, with just a note that this just make, let's make sure this is open. You know, every, anybody feels welcome at this event. Um, and then also a request to the applicant that the neighbors all be invited um, in the vicinity of the area. Even if, it, it sounds like Whitney, you're already planning to do that, but just f to cover our bases, let's make sure we invite all of the neighbors in the vicinity so nobody feels left out when they see what's happening at the park. Um, so that's my motion. 
Was that a, a question for the applicant or no, just a state, a comment? No, that was just okay. a comment, yeah. Now with the, the date pushed back, we, you know, we will try to bring an update to the commission. If there's anything that seems to be a major change, we can bring the item back under old business um, with, at either the August meeting or the September meeting. Dates to be determined for the September meeting. So just to be clear, there's no action requested tonight, Director Mentor. We were asking the commission to approve or to consider approval of. Um, you know, you have a couple options. Uh, you can, you know, table it or continue it to a future meeting date if there is specific feedback that you want, either from staff or the applicant, or you can approve it, you know, giving staff direction to um, note the comments that were made by commissioners here today and work with the applicant to make that happen. Yeah, I, I think I'd like to make, unless there's any more comments from commissioners, uh, sure, M M Commissioner Brown, go ahead. For, for me to support this, because I'm representing all of Costa Mesa in this way, I would need assurance in writing that this is open to the public and will be communicated as all open to the public city events are. So that's, that's what I would personally want, um, which is just in line with how we do business in the city, that publics are public space open to all. But I would want written assurance that it will be communicated via the social media platforms. I think that's a prudent suggestion. So um, I, I would like to make a motion to approve this item then with the commissioner comments considered and with staff consideration, but I, I think we wanna move this forward and we want people to know that if they wanna plan something in our park, they're gonna be welcome to do so. And just for clarity in your motion, um, you know, I broadly said with comments from the commissioners, but if there's something specific you want read into the motion, I would ask for clarity on that. So one item that I've heard clearly is that it be open to the public and advertised as such. Is there anything else contingency-wise that the commissioners want stated for the record of the motion? Um, in addition to that, I would say specifically notice all of the neighbors who ad live adjacent to Balearic Park. That, that would be a condition that we would require already, but yes, noted. I appreciate that that staff was already gonna do that, so just a redundant suggestion then. So that's the motion, if um, you need any clarification on that, or if that makes sense. No, it's all. And uh, Commissioner Dorn, yeah. oh, sorry. <laughs> and I will go ahead and second your motion, because I know, you know, even though October seems far away, in order to ensure that the, you know, the applicant has plenty of time and also advertising, I would second the motion with that clarification that it is a public event um, and will be provided information across all of our general normal communication. I understand that, you know, normally, like with our sponsor concerts in the part is a little different, but just make sure the community of the entire Costa Mesa understands what this um, business, private business is providing, which is wonderful. So I agree with your comments about, we really wanna engage business community and individuals and groups to come forward with these amazing opportunities, and especially music, arts, and everything. So with that, I will second that. Thank you. Do you wanna press the second button on your screen? I tried to. Oh, see, now my mic's on. I second it. All right, Ms. Fatou, I hope we did that right. Yes, and then we can now do the vote so that everyone, um, you may look at your screens and vote on there. Commissioner Andrade Vallarta. All right. Motion carries 5 0 to approve with the conditions of advertising to all and uh, notifying surrounding neighbors of the event. If I can just do a follow up. So, Ms. Retzel, um, Laura will be reaching out um, and discussing it further. Um, thank you for being here and, and uh, you know, telling us a little bit more about the event and we'll definitely be in touch and working with you on this soon. Thank you, Director, Mentor, and team. Um, the last item of new business is a request to reschedule the Parks and Community Services Commission meeting date. Director Mentor, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, uh, you know, the we 
we get comments sometimes about how long things take and you know we have a great idea and we want to implement it so this is one of the the things that i've wanted to do since i started two years ago so even my own projects sometimes take longer than uh, than i anticipate but um you know because of some of the changes that have taken place recently with the creation of the arts commission and the uh the going away of the the culture arts committee I was always, had always been looking for an opportunity to shift our commission meetings up in the month so that they're not stuck on the, the fourth Thursday of the month. So the second Thursday of the month has become available. Uh, you know, this gives us an opportunity to hopefully get information more relevant to the, to the commissioners with regards to monthly reports. Uh, you know, two weeks is only two weeks, but you know, that's, that's 14 days of events and things happening. So I believe it's a minor change or kind of a cleanup or a rescheduling. Uh, this has been approved by the city clerk. Um, the Arts Commission, we would be looking to have those meetings on the first Thursday of the month. And so that's advertising should get out, go out shortly. But it's a, a pretty simple item. Um, I did kind of miss, I forgot to ask Public Works, my friends in Public Works, if they were okay with it. But I did get an assurance yesterday evening that, you know, despite feeling left out of the conversation, that he would be okay with it. So my apologies to Rob and Sung for not bringing you engaged. I was so excited to finally bring my own item forward. So um, with that, I'm here to answer any questions that you have, but hopefully uh, this would not be a convenience or a major inconvenience to any of your schedules. Not at all. Thank you, Director Minter. Go ahead, Vice Chair. When will the meeting Second. The second would be August or September. Uh, as stated in the item, it's the September meeting would be the first the implementation of this new schedule. If we did it the second meeting or the second Thursday in August, I would have to miss. So I don't want to I don't want to change it and miss my own changed meeting. So, but we also need time to to change the rotation of the agenda posting. And, and if we had it approved tonight, we would be looking to you know make those reports early as next week. So it gives us a little more time to build it into the the clerk schedule. Sounds great. Okay. I will make that motion. Thank you, Commissioner Ashendorf. And I'll second. And, oh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, do we, I believe we have to open this item up to public comment. We should, yes. Okay. If there are any members of the public who wish to speak, please raise your hand. There are no hands raised, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Fatua. Um, now we can get back to Did, did Rob want to make a comment? Did you? Did you? No, you're good. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ms. Fatua. You can do the roll now. All right. Motion carries 4-1. Is that correct, sir? I just want to make sure. I'm sorry. No, I, okay. I messed that up. I'm okay. so sorry. I can make that adjustment. <laughs> the truth comes out. <laughs> <laughs> Motion carries 5-0 for all commissioners present to move with the second Thursdays of each month, starting September as the first. Thank you for bearing with my heavy finger. Um, that is the end of new business. Uh, next is monthly reports. Uh, Director Mentor. Uh, do you have any comments about the park ranger report for June 22? I do not. Thank you. Are there any commissioner questions or comments about the park ranger report? Seeing none, uh, we will open this item up for public comment. Ms. Fatua, are there any public comments on this item? I see no hands raised. We'll close public comments. And we'll receive and file this report. The uh, last item on the agenda is our director's report from our fearless director mentor. The floor is yours. Man, I don't know about fearless, but um, it has been one heck of a month. I think July started with uh, with some fireworks. Um, I, I'm still unbelievably impressed with the community support. You know, all of the people that showed up for that July 3rd event. Uh, you know, I still have vivid memories of, of the crowds and, you know, just kind of that rave type atmosphere that was happening, 
you know, Monique in particular tossing out, you know, glow bracelets and necklaces and, and just all the, the energy that was, uh, that I felt, you know, as we were on stage and, and kind of taking care of some of that stuff. But I think that, you know, the bands that played, the, the just, we were really worried about not having enough space for everyone in that area. But, you know, a lot of work went into it. I definitely want to commend Monique, um, you know, for all the time and effort that she put into it on top of balancing, you know, all the planning that took place for concerts in the park. You know, July was a super busy month with, you know, camps and, and reopening of the, the pool that, you know, with the new plaster, it just, June, July was, was pretty hectic. So, you know, I'm looking forward to a little bit quieter of an August, getting caught up in some things. Um, you know, there have been quite a few projects and things that have taken place for those of you that weren't paying attention or aren't necessarily football fans. Uh, the LA Chargers opened camp yesterday. Uh, some of our staff members were invited out to go and, and kind of watch and enjoy and participate in some of those festivities. So that was a lot of fun. Um, you know, the Chargers will only be with us for probably one more summer, so we want to appreciate them while they're, while they're here. Um, even longtime 49er fan Monique uh, was wearing Chargers gear, so just for the record, I wanted to, to, to put that out there. Um, we do have a, a little bit more multimedia for you tonight. Uh, one of the Capital Project updates was the Jack Hammett Sports Complex. Uh, that con the contractor was um, gracious enough to do kind of a video showing, you know, the progress of the project over the last uh, seven months now. So um, it's kind of a short video, but a lot of little cool aerial or uh, drone type coverage. So here you go. That was very exciting. I mean, we can also title that Soren over Jack Hammett, if you uh, like the ride at Disneyland. Uh, but it's really cool to see approximately 60 more parking spaces, additional security lighting. Uh, one of my favorite pieces is the, uh, the removal of the containers that were on the back parking lot. So all seven containers have been removed. Uh, some of that equipment has been stored in the storage building that you saw pictured, but it's you know just really nice to be on that back lot and not have the obstruction. And, and we picked up you know seven more parking spots there. Uh, accessibility improvements, um, so there's more handicap access to it, and just a, lo a lot of pro you know a lot of effort went into that. Rob has been a part of it. George has been a part of it. Sung um, Hector was the project manager. Nas before that, who had left the city. Uh, and then Raja, obviously, you know, kind of overseeing, you know, everything that's going on. I would like to give a shout out to our very own Emily uh, Pulaski, who, as the coordinator of getting those containers removed, uh, you know, the dates, the changing, 
coordinating all the stuff that went into it was was quite frustrating. I know for, for all involved and Emily stuck with it and made sure all the groups got their stuff moved, relocated. Keep in mind that uh, most of this project, we were still having groups on the fields. There were tournaments on some of the weekends trying to coordinate parking when pretty much the most, the major parts of the parking lot were closed. So, you know, congrats to Emily. Um, we're not quite signed off on this project, but you know, as evidenced yesterday, um, we are in, in full swing in terms of Chargers Camp, and, it, and it's beautiful to see. The parking lot is amazing. The storage building is, you know, there's little, little tweaks here and there that we're going to need to make over the next couple of months, but it's such a great project, and we're very happy to have that open, so thank you to all involved in that. Uh, we talked about Tanager Park. The exercise area is new. The playground is new, and obviously the new the two new pickleball courts. I expect to see you out there with your paddles at some point. Um, I know Commissioner Ashendorf was out there for a few minutes. You took you took a few swings yesterday. Yep, I could hear the thud. It was awesome. Very good. Um, and then Jordan Park, uh, the the construction fencing was pulled down from Tanager and replaced over at Jordan Park as they get ready to start that project. Um, the Norma Herzog Center is kind of one of our last. They're, they're trying to wrap up the patio project. There's just some material apparently that has been back ordered and kind of critical to getting that patio open. We have been able to use the Norma Herzog Center for some limited events, but we're really excited about getting it open to the public and we have a new coordinator on board um, that was a promotion from within and we're very excited uh, to welcome Victoria to our team and hopefully we'll bring her before a commission so you can meet our new coordinator but we're also hiring a new aquatics coordinator so we'll have a couple new staff members to bring forward um, but so much going on um, Brentwood Park we mentioned there with that I will turn it over to Monique to talk about programs take it away um, I'm gonna keep it short with programs as you guys have all mentioned we are wrapping up summer, very, very busy. Um, events are not just the only thing we do. We do camps, rocks programs, um, uh, animal services. We still do it all. And um, I just like to jump on board and we say, I, I think we have a really good staff and team here in our department. Um, I think what a lot of people don't see is that some days some staff will be working you know, seven to five, a camp shift, and then go straight to a concert in the park and help wrap up until 10 o'clock at night. Um, so we share staff between all kinds of events and programs. And so they really, um, they really kick it into high gear in these months and we really appreciate how hard they work. So just jumping on that bandwagon with them with uh, programs, um, the report, just the numbers show how busy we are in summer. Uh, so just a couple of things that aren't on, on the report. Um, We've ActiveNet is our recreation software program. Um, so when you go onto our website and you need to register for programs, ActiveNet is our is our software, and that's what we utilized. We have been going through kind of a back end revamp to see kind of some updates that we can apply. So I am happy to report that now when you go onto our site, you can at least see an online calendar for when our um, open gym hours are for pickleball, for basketball, for volleyball. And also the generic um, uh, park sh shelter and picnic area um, availability. You cannot rent online, but at least now you can go online and see if your park shelter is available during the, the maybe the day and the time um, that you maybe are looking at, which wasn't previously available before. You would have to call in and ask, um, is this available? And now you can go online and see for yourself if it's av available for whatever day you want. Sorry. <coughs> um, but other than that, I um, didn't know if we were going to, okay, <laughs> I will give it back to Jason to uh, finish off. All right, so we teased this last month and we were hoping to have a, a hard copy kind of a sample for you, but uh, staff has been hard at work. Um, Tiana Johnson has been the, the primary. She's our, our assistant rec supervisor that's responsible for the recreation guide, which even saying it, recreation guide, you're like, <sighs> it's just a boring. So. With a revamp of the recreation guide, you know, staff have been uh, brainstorming. There's been list after list and vote after vote internally, but the uh, the recreation guide is going to be rebranded. It's going to have a slightly different shape, slightly different paper. It's going to definitely have a new look and new branding, and it will now be known as the Costa Mesa Spotlight. 
So the spotlight will highlight all of the fun things that we do. Um, we'll have spotlights dedicated to the arts, a spotlight dedicated to Fairview Park, a spotlight dedicated to whatever is you know happening or special that that's particular season, that that month, that whatever. So we're really excited about it. That word spotlight is something that you know you'll you'll probably hear more and more and see when you get the guide. Um, we are in like crunch time now to get the guide ready and, and you know one of the things that we're really trying to focus on is just that appeal of you know the cover is going to have a redesigned look and you know we were really trying to, to brand that as hey did you get your spotlight so you as commissioners you are going to be our ambassadors to get that message out there hey rebranding look for your spotlight you know it's hopefully going to have more of a magazine type feel um, have features in it throughout where you get to see information about the facilities, but you know it, it's going to have kind of regular occurrences or spotlights that highlight different programs or different opportunities, you know, here in our in our department. So we're really excited about it. Um, trying to find that you know the million dollar cover shot isn't you know always as easy as you want it to be. And that's one of the reasons we weren't able to get a cover for you. We didn't want to, to fake a cover. We wanted it to be real. We want real pictures of, of, of Costa Mesa residents at Costa Mesa facilities. And you know, for those of you that have done any publishing, you know it can be quite a task to get like that perfect shot. So that's what we're working on. I am really sorry that we don't have uh, you know a hard copy for you to show. We even had a debate about the best way to give it to the commissioners. And, and one vote was, when they get it in the mail, they're gonna be like, wow. So that is our update on the Costa Mesa Spotlight. So formerly the Rec Guide, uh, but we really think that there's gonna be some exciting changes in there. We're updating the map. We're trying to consolidate pages. We're gonna to try to show the council districts and different facilities all in the same map. Um, highlights obviously the schools and the facilities and, and all other things that that really matter to our you know to our community um, but it is an exciting but tedious process and, and thanks to Tiana obviously um, we also have Sean in our in our graphics um, department that has been working nonstop on this as well so we hope that you like it we are looking you know for feedback once it comes out and just because you know we've launched it doesn't mean there aren't going to be tweaks along the way so if there's something that you see or think has been missed or you'd like to see highlighted by all means you know drop me a note drop Monique a note or whatever and just let us know what you think but we really hope that you know we're going to do a better job with the meeting schedule of getting information to you as commissioners getting you to come out to events you know to be a part of them you know I do appreciate I think we had six at our at our ribbon cutting last night so thank you so much for for showing up and supporting I think the council really appreciates you know all that you do there's a lot of uh, hot button topics out there um, not all of them have easy solutions like dog parks and things like that but we're really excited to move forward in this direction and have the spotlight is you know spotlight in the community did you know dogs off leash you know we have just another method of trying to get critical information you know to get people's attention so it's only a quarterly you know, it'd be great if it were, you know, more often, but I think even as a quarterly, we're still going to be able to get the, you know, messages out to the public on, on things of importance in our parks. So with that, that concludes our director's report. If you have any questions, Monique and I are here to, uh, to help on those or any other fun projects that we have going on. Thank you, Director Mender. Great report. Are there any comments or, uh, Commissioner Ashendorf? Uh, yes. Um, I see under the art uh, report that um, a little more than 30 applications were received for Art Venture and the deadline is closed. Are they, are they happy with the number of applications for Art Venture? Yes, and in fact, if they come in, uh, Laura is still Great. considering the applications. We had actually one come in today and so Perfect. she talked with the artist for a little bit. So um, yeah, because, um, you know, Pandemic wise, people are still, there's still people Perfect. out and you know, there, so we're still giving people extra time. Great, and mm -hmm. uh, shout out to Lorette for her spotlight on Art Venture. That was great to see. The second um, question or comment is you say that Charger football camp began on the 27th, but how long does it run? Do we still have time to see them? Yes, it runs through the end of August. It's like a 35-day camp, I think, like that. Like They turn the fields back over t to us, and they need time to still prep them. So I forget what the date is. It changes a little bit as the season goes. Um, but, yeah, you have... We um, still have a, we still have 
ch a time. It's there's more there, than a month left. Yeah. Okay, and then one comment. Um, finally, that uh, you mentioned that the new coordin coordinator has been hired, and I'm hoping, you know, I had an opportunity to be a part of a, a nonprofit event at another city in the county, and they offer their community rooms to nonprofits for free if they can demonstrate their nonprofit status. And so I was hoping we could get some feedback because we have a lot of nonprofits in the city always looking for places to hold meetings, if that's something we could know about the, the policy for reservations for nonprofits. Thank you. Um, I believe we do offer have that same policy for nonprofit organizations. No, we don't. I so. No, so we have new fees for NHCC um, Center because the Neighborhood Community Center was a different kind of a older and a bigger center. The NHCC is a one-room center and it's remodeled, so there were different fees set for nonprofits. Now, we always have the ability to, and Jason has the ability to waive fees uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but we're really trying to... Um, balance the fact that we want to make this a destination venue for somebody who might be planning a wedding or something like that and balance it with community needs um, for nonprofits and everything like that. So it's really about finding the balance of how to utilize the center um, for people wanting to rent it, you know, and if that makes sense. Yeah. For example, um, City Hall has a conference room here and, in, and around the back, and if a nonprofit said, I'd like Mondays from 10 until noon to hold our board meetings, um, would that be a possibility? Other than Norm, Norma Herzog, the, the facility at the City Hall. I know in the past, before my time here, that, that, that used to be considered. Mm -hmm. So that would have to be arranged, I think, with you know our clerk's department Perfect. and other people here at City Hall to see if that would be a possibility. All right. So we could definitely talk about that and get more information on that. Thank you. I appreciate um, but that. But yes. Mm -hmm. you, you can have groups contact us, and, and we'll try to work with them. Unfortunately, we just don't have the sheer number of facilities. Uh, the city I came from, we had seven different parks with all had park buildings. And they facilitated free use for Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, you know, Audubon Society, and things like that. So, unfortunately, we just don't have the those facilities to offer out. Um, we do have access to one of the meeting rooms in the Dungan Library, um, so that also can be available on a limited basis, but it has to be scheduled. So, we're working on it. Um, but you know, if it if in the two years that I've been here, unfortunately, we haven't really rented anything from pandemic to construction to now. Um, so I have some catching up to do. My apologies. I also think that um, it's worth noting that we're trying to bring online the senior center as a rentable facility, which hasn't been in the past. Um, we've only used it as a backup facility when needed. So we're trying to get that up and going as a rental facility as well. So that way we have more than just the NHCC um, and sometimes Balearic. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Brown. Or I'm sorry, Commissioner Vallarta was ahead of you in the queue. My bad. Um, I just had a quick question, um, Monique. Um, I know you mentioned the upgrades for the website, which is great. I've used it so many times for all the after-school programming and the camp. Um, but I learned that the to I think it was to pay for rocks for after-school starting in the fall was in person. Was there? Uh, I don't know what was the change uh, this past year because I heard parents were just making comments, long lines, waiting to come in and make payment to reserve or to like pay for their spot? So um, we, what we ended up doing for this is we allowed in-person payments to allow opportunities for people to enroll in a monthly payment plan. However, um, it's a little bit more complex than doing this online. And so to have ah. that timeline to get everyone in prior um, for online format, um, that was the current option we had to um, ensure that people knew if they had daycare or not for the beginning of the school year. So that way they're enrolled throughout the whole year and then as people uh -huh. move forward, go ahead. Yeah. And then also accessibility. Not everybody always has um, 
access to a computer or to a registration and then it crashes and you have to have, you know, wherever you utilize your computer, your Wi-Fi, your internet. Um, so we, and this I've done at prior agencies too, where you make a registration in person only so that everybody has a fair shot at registering because some of the sites are very impacted. And, you know, California Elementary School, which is one of our biggest, school, bigger schools, you know, uh, various ones. We want to make sure that everybody has equal access at the same time to register these for these programs because they fill up so quickly. And then you can touch on the, there is a, a shortage, like we're still hurting for staff and, and so there were fewer spots in some of our programs, which means, you know, the demand would, would go up and, and the, the public could sense that. And so, you know, part of the, the reason for longer lines was people realizing, hey, there's fewer spots, I better get those. So this is a, another shameless plug for additional staff. If anybody out there is, is watching or if any of your kids have aged enough to where they're ready to come work for us, please send them our way. And we will be fine-tuning the registration process as we go along. You know, so, uh, maybe next year it will be only um, one or two schools on certain registration days at a time, so there's not such as long lines. You know, we're, we're still learning the process. This, this was actually my first ROCS registration for in-person. Um, so, you know, just learning and trying to make the process better and more fair. Thank you. Just a few more years and my son will be ready. <laughs> Uh, Commissioner Brown. Uh, two quick questions. The first is about the utility box. Are we are we still accepting applications for the utility box design art creation? I was curious about that, and then and like how we would go about that. And then the second question I have um, is about the spotlight, actually. And I'm wondering what the online presence for it will look like. I was intrigued by your comment around it being more magazine-like, and so I was curious, um, and I'm ashamed to say I don't know what it was like online before, so I don't know if it was a PDF that you used or if you used, however you say that issue, issue, whatever the different kind of magazine styles are. I was just curious if you have a sense of what the online presence will look like. That's it. So the Utility Box art program is an ongoing application. You could always submit your art through the... Um, through our website, um, we're constantly uh, accepting applications and they approve utility box art. You know, it was formerly with the committee and then that, that will transition to Laura and the, and the commission in the future. Um, so we're always looking at utility box art applications. Uh, with the, the new spotlight guide that will, that's, uh, during the pandemic, it was to online only, but it was always mailed quarterly to every home in Costa Mesa. Um, it's a, a flip book, so it's it looks more like a magazine when you flip through it. Um, the difference is it's going to be all in color. Uh, right now, we have it's it's newspaper style, black and white. Only a, a few pages are colorful. It's going to be the regular eight and a half by eleven style so you know just a few different things that will definitely coordinate with our website you know our website is still going to go through a redesign process so we'll make sure to incorporate that and make it kind of one big brand mm -hmm. not to confuse the snapshot which i'm sure you all get that's going to be different don't confuse snapshot and spotlight two different things so and now that i said them both in the same sentence i know i'm going to screw those up but yes, we will try to, to carry forward some of the spotlight things onto our website as uh, the city manager's office is taking lead on that and, and working with our staff to do that. So yeah, we are gonna try to mirror those things up. And the flip book you know, even makes that little page noise if you have your sound on. So it's kind of a neat little touch. Awesome. Um, Vice Chair Dorn Parker, did you have any comments? I just wanted to ask, does the spotlight include the arts commission? Any work, you know, any highlights of that or is it just Parks and Rec? There will be a section on, on you know, dedicated to art. It'll be kind of Lorette's, you know, page to update. And then there would be a spotlight on art section that we would try to focus on different programs, whether it's utility box art or art venture obviously is going to be a key as, as the next big event. Um, you know, again, just kind of a, a teaser that is um, designated the cover for this upcoming issue that you should see. Just trying to find that that right million dollar picture that we can really sell our adventure on. Um, but yes, we we are trying to spotlight a, you know a different things and have them as regular features. So there would be a, a designated arts page. Um. Just to touch on that, yeah. you know, the spotlight is not just a recreation brochure anymore. Anymore, uh, slogan just. You know, a little teaser, it's uh, your guide for everything, you know, recreation, 
parks, events, and arts. So just kind of keep that slogan in your mind. That's what you'll see from here on out. That's a cool vision. I mean, you, you, you have us excited. Um, I thought Commissioner Ashendorf made an excellent point about the nonprofit fee structure, especially as you mentioned, I think that's exciting, Jason. You know, the, the past two years are what they are, but we're coming out of that. So if there is a time to reevaluate what resident groups are charged for using the recreation centers, maybe it's the time. And I think we should, there are a lot of great nonprofits in the city and we would want any nonprofit to feel welcome in the city. Um, on that note, actually, um, I, I uh, was very pleased to meet the new president of the Harbor Soaring Society. He's a, a fairly young uh, homeowner in West Side Costa Mesa. Um, and I wanted to ask if they had submitted a application for a class as part of the, I was gonna say recreation guide, but as, <laughs> as part of the spotlight. We'll give you a little little grace period. Tonight is definitely included. Yes, the rec guide. Um, I know I had seen questions on it. I don't know if he had actually, if they'd actually submitted. I think, you know, first order of business is the flying field. I know that uh, is on their agenda for the Fairview Park Steering Committee on April 10th. Um, you know, and there's still decisions to be made by city council about what's gonna happen with that. And I think there's a lot of a nexus between the, the flying field or the glider launch site. Uh, and any classes or programs they would be offering, but I am aware that they would, would like to do something like that, yes. Awesome. Um, yeah, it's complicated, but I just wanted to say I, I would really support um, f it offering that because I think one of the criticisms of the fly field is that it hasn't been for kids. So I, I was really excited to hear that there's younger folks involved um, that they wanna make it more for kids. Uh, do you have an up, and you already answered my next question, Jason, what, do you have an expectation of when the fly field is gonna be open, or the gliding field, excuse me, or any, and if you don't have a rough estimate, that's okay, but I was just curious as to where that's at, what we can expect down the line. The, the steering committee is a bi-monthly committee, committee. By bi-monthly, I mean every two months, not twice a month. Um, it's been on their agenda the last three meetings, discussions on the flying field. Um, they've asked at the last, the dra a draft was presented at their last meeting. Uh, there were additional comments and requests for information or for inclusion by members of the public or the stakeholder groups and by the committee members. That's what will be coming forward, another revision or a revised draft that will hopefully be the, the final that the committee can vote on to either approve or deny and, and we'll be taking whatever that recommendation is to council hopefully in the next couple of months. But the review process at the Fairview Steering Committee level has been extensive. Um, and it's, I mean, since the day I started, they were already, I think, six months in. So it's a two and a half year process so far. We have council direction. So yeah, that's the next step is hopefully this fall uh, to come before city council and get their direction on the flying field ordinance. I appreciate that update, Jason. I didn't realize they had gone before the committee three times. Uh, the first one is the introduction of the topic and then what would you like to see? That was kind of step one. Step two was a revision, a redline version. Took some feedback, brought it back to the third meeting. There was additional review, additional comments. So all stakeholders have been involved, including the Fairview Park Alliance, the Harbor Soaring Society, the Audubon Society. Um, you know, we've had, you know, good feedback. Uh, it just not succinct in terms of the process, but I think that shows you know, the efforts of the committee and of staff to make sure that we uh, hear everybody out in this review. Awesome, I appreciate that. I didn't mean to sidetrack your excellent director's report with, about the flying field. And then the last question, Jason, is when would community groups expect to be able to contact the recreation coordinator and begin the process of reserving either the Adams room at the library or the Norma Herzog, unless that process has already begun? We were sharing staff, uh, you know, some one of the problems with uh, promoting from within is you create a vacancy within. Uh, and so we were asking our, our new staff, Victoria, to try to help out with her old position to get through summer as she was starting to learn and train everything on the new one. So with the patio project still somewhat in doubt, she, you know, the transition has started. Um, I, I hope by the end of April or of August, we would have permits booked, we're, so. Hmm? We're, we're trying to shoot for 
October 1st, only because we have some fine tuning to do with our um, policies and regulations because it, trying to carry over everything from the NA, NCC to the NHCC doesn't always apply the same. Different rooms, different types of kitchens. Um, the other one was a full cooking kitchen. This is like a catering kitchen. So, you know, just looking at some of those. And so, Victoria, and then we have to put all those into our reg reservation system still. Um, so the way we book out our all and apply fees and how everybody books, um, we're still putting that into our active net system, which, which is what we use. So and, you know, it's all depending on when our new coordinator can get over get over here and start digging into that. And so um, we have a, a goal of September, October. So that's, you know, but it all depends on when we can get all that up and running. We're trying to start taking reservations possibly before that, but not actually implementing them. And, and like she said, like some of them are, it, it's going to be a transition process with a new staff member. But uh, you did touch on, don't forget, National Night Out is uh, August 2nd at Lions Park. Um, so go and, and support the police department or come to city council and talk about housing, either one. Yeah, August 2nd, there's a lot going to be going on that night. Um, do you have anything else you want to add to your report, Jason? Or we'll open it up to public comment? No, I, well, I'll, I'll think of something, I'm sure, but I'm good for now. All right, uh, Ms. Fatua, are there any, we'll open this item up to public comment now. Are there any members of the public who wanted to speak on this? If there are any members who wish to speak, please raise your hand. Chair, I see no hands raised. Awesome, thank you. We'll close public comment. We'll receive and file the report. Thank you again, Director Minter. Um, and this is just something um, I wanted to toss in just to make sure we're recognizing everybody who's a part of the team because teamwork makes the dream work. Um, so I just wanted to quickly go around the room to all of the city team to see if there's any personal updates, any cool things you're working on, any exciting life updates you wanna share with us before we head home tonight. Uh, so Mr. Ryan, we'll start with you. Thank you, Chair Rutherford. No, I think uh, I've got the biggest project under our belt with uh, Tanager Pickleball Park. Uh, courts and the playground at Tanager, taking a little bit of a breather and then jumping right into Jordan Park. So that's that's it. We are we are going through our sports field renovations as uh, as uh, Commissioner Ashendorf mentioned. She knows Davis Field was under renovation. Um, all of our fields go through an annual reservation uh, renovation every summer. Um, so baseball fields at Teewinkle have started. Softball fields will follow uh, the Blairick soccer fields um, as well as the soccer fields at FDC. So those, those will be ongoing through, uh, I believe, the end of August, maybe sometime in September when the, when the last one finally wraps up. But thank you. Exciting stuff. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Ms. Villasenor. Um, I think one of the under talked about was our active net system um, on the back end. That was a huge project for us. In fact, I'd like to thank Laura. Um, she and I worked on that very extensively to bring just more accessibility on our online reservation system, which I thought was really important when I came on board. Um, but going forward, I know that we had a lot of events, but Art Ventures coming up in September, and believe it or not, it takes that much time from now until then to prep. Um, so that will be a team between, you know, uh, Lorette and Ashley and myself um, and, and, a, and a lot of other staff to get ready for that. And then right after that will be Scarecrow Fest. Um, and then right after that, simultaneously, I shouldn't say right after that, but simultaneously, we will start beginning working on Snoopy House um, probably tomorrow. So uh, we, you know, we work on a lot of events all at the same time, and we try to elevate them every year. So it's all about trying to see what we can do better or differently. Um, so we always look for recommendations. So if you have anything that you want to see done at any of the future events, let us know. But yeah, it's constant constant planning on our end. <laughs> Exciting stuff. Thank you, Monique. Uh, Ms. Fatua. I would just like to add for the facility interest, um, the front desk main line uh, is taking inquiries and we are gonna email blast when there's more information for uh, internal rentals. So, I mean, not internal, I'm sorry, facility rentals. So just so you guys know. Is that, awesome. that? No, just special events. <laughs> and then Mr. Yang, how's it going over there? Very good, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. So. Um, Nothing in particular to report other than that for the Public Works Department, uh, we're gonna engage on 
doing Wilson Street uh, starting next week. So they're going to be doing a major improvement in terms of street. Uh, first order of work is doing the parkway, concrete, sidewalks, curb and gutter, and uh, all the amenities that we, we expect to see in revitalizing uh, Wilson Street. But on the parks and community services end, uh, we're working closely with uh, the department for the skate park expansion project. So we're undertaking a new request for proposals to get a design consultant on board, design the expansion of the skate park. And the thing is, and uh, we uh, look forward to working with uh, the department in that regard. So uh, that's all for me and I defer back to the chair. That last update, that's very exciting. Skate park, very cool. Um, well then, well thank you all. Really appreciate all the work everybody's doing and I think that brings us to the end of the agenda. So I'll adjourn at 8.33 p.m. <laughs>